Yes, well, as you can see from, uh, from my title, this is an attempt to talk about uh, everything, everything about everything in 10 minutes. So we'll see how we get on. Uh, but uh, off we go. So um, I'm going to talk about the way that we approach societal challenges and finding solutions to them, and then I'm going to give you some examples. First of all, a very simple analysis of what we see are the challenges in the world, and there are four, and they're all interlinked. Um, we see that the socio-economic system is unsustainable. I need to say no more about that in this forum. But it's an equal problem that it's unfair. So this is about the distribution of resources. Uh, recently, Oxfam published a report that showed that the, top, uh, the, the, the richest five families in the UK uh, owned as much wealth as the bottom fifth, 12 and a half million people in the UK. Um, now, there are all sorts of reasons why that's important. You might be familiar with the uh, Wilson and Pickett type analysis. Uh, spirit level, but actually in economic terms, if you have such concentrations of wealth and income, that causes instability in the system. Uh, move, moving on to the third point, um, economics tends to, in our view, uh, be rather over-concerned with efficiency and not really understand system concepts like resilience. Uh, and the financial, my area of expertise is the financial system, this is particularly uh, relevant, of course, post the crash of 2008. And uh, last but very definitely not least, what is the point of it all, you might ask? Um, so if our economic system is not actually leading to better outcomes in terms of lived human experience, then we need to do something about it. Uh, so we do a lot of work around uh, well-being, for example, as being the true goal of progress rather than simply GDP. So to dig into uh, the way we look at economics, I suppose, any uh, perhaps uh, orthodox economists in the room, cover your ears and look away now. Um, so this is what we think about the way that economics is often implemented in orthodox uh, ways in government departments and so on. So, uh, you know, perhaps being deliberately provocative. Market prices are always wrong. This is simply my way of asserting uh, what you'd probably be familiar with, the concept of externalities. There are always things that are external to the market, social, environmental impacts. These are important. And we must never lose sight of the fact of as valuable as the market economy and market uh, mechanisms are, market prices are always wrong. They do not include all necessary information. Secondly, we confuse ends with means. How often do we hear in the press and the media about growth, GDP? Growth meaning GDP, those two things are considered synonymous. But the GDP is just a means to an end, right? We don't want more GDP just for the sake of it. We want it because we think it will help human progress, it will help living standards. Yeah, but actually, you mustn't confuse the ends with the means, because often we find that GDP as an intermediate variable isn't a very good measure of progress. In fact, the, 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 the inventors of GDP made this point very strongly right at the beginning. Uh, economics has an odd view of human behaviour. Um, I mean, you know, I probably don't need to sort of say much more about, you know, are there any rational utility maximisers in the room today? Uh, put your hand up if you are. No, didn't think so. Laws of thermodynamics, quite extraordinary. Economic students uh, will, will, will qualify uh, without probably ever meeting that phrase. But what is the, the, what is the economic system? It is a system of flows of materials and energy, right? Is it not? Well, how could you possibly analyse that without understanding the laws of thermodynamics? I don't know. Uh, systems oversimplified, I made this point about sim systems, um, in order to construct uh, neat mathematical models of the economy, you have to assume, obviously, that it's much simpler than it is. Nothing wrong with that. Mod all models can tell us something. But we feel that in policy making often, you know, the Treasury's macroeconomic model is considered to be uh, much more of a model of what's going on than re in reality it actually is. Uh, and finally, uh, very close to my heart as head of finance and business, misunderstanding of money. Um, I don't have time to talk at length about that now, but, but, but it, let's put it this way. It turns out that if you're interested in the outcomes of an economic system uh, in terms of its social and environmental impact, uh, you find, and you look at the economic system and what drives it, you'll find that the financial system and indeed the way that money itself is created and used in the system turns out to be quite an important driver of that. So if we're not understanding correctly the dynamics of the money system, how money is created, how it's allocated, and to what purpose, then it's going to become very hard to achieve our desired social and environmental outcomes. But luckily, um, help is at hand, because of course there, there are lots, there's lots of good practice, rich academic traditions and policy practice around that can address all of these issues. I mean, there are branches of economics that deal, deal with all of them, in fact. And we are essentially a heterodox economics think tank. We are multidisciplinary, we take a broad approach, 
and we, you know, we, we look across different disciplines for answers to these problems, which is absolutely, of course, what the ISSR is all about as well. So, uh, but, but let's just frame the way that we, we look at the economy then. Um, this is what we'd, how we'd characterise the, the way that uh, the dominant sort of narrative of, of economics and, and indeed progress works. You've got resources, you've got a planet, you've got capital, you've got labour, factors of production. The end goal is growth. Even in the Horizon 2020, you noticed it talked about sustainable growth. Yeah, that's embedded right in the framing. The whole framing, the whole thing is about growth. And the economy is this bit. It's capital and labour. doesn't really include you know, the planet. That's sort of external somehow to the economy. Uh, and, you know, and, and it's capital and labour that generate wealth. Okay? So that's, that's what the current framing of progress looks like. Uh, now, we reject that. We think that's not very fit for purpose. That's not a very good way of understanding the world or society or indeed the economy. So we prefer something that looks a bit like, oh, so, so just to say resources being external, so you, you, know, you, you use planetary resources, they feed into the system, uh, you kick out lots of uh, pollution and other impacts into the environment, those go out of the system. If you're lucky, you might have some environmental economists around who might try and price those arrows, but it's still seen as very much external to the whole thing. This is how we like to think about it. We've got our inputs, we've got uh, resources, we've only got one planet. Uh, what we're after, growth in what, you might ask? Well, human well-being, uh, social justice, many would consider as pretty important to what the outcomes are we're looking for in society. Um, so, so this is what's important. Um, the economy's not in there yet, okay, but obviously it's important. Um, it's an intermediating system, isn't it? And it's a socio-economic system. You can't really tease apart the social and the economic parts. And that's why I've sort of in the little graphics, I made the point, you know, that we've got, we've got markets, we've got things that are priced, we've got things that are marketised, and we've got a whole load of activity that isn't priced, isn't marketised. Yeah, unpaid labour, um, which, funnily enough, tends to be carried out by women all around the world. Now, we call that the core economy, because this is, this is activity that is generating wealth, not marketised. Now, you can't really analyse the social economic system by only looking at the market bit. You've got to always pay attention to all of it. That's how we view it. So let me give you some examples of what this means. Uh, in terms of different goals, uh, one way of conceptualising the um, uh, efficiency, the socio-economic efficiency of a system, you might say, is how good, it is, how good is it at turning planetary resources into human well-being? And the Happy Planet Index measures that. It's a very simple efficiency index. It doesn't tell you the happiest place in the world to live. It's an efficiency index. So if I point to a couple of countries that are flashing up red, you've got the United States, and you've also seen most of sub-Saharan Africa in there, for two completely different reasons. The economies in sub-Saharan Africa do not support a high enough level of material consumption. But, but they're, they're, not, they're not, therefore, drawing on planetary resources too much. But that's a problem that needs to be solved, and that's, that's not what we're after. But the US, of course, does generate high levels of life satisfaction and life expectancy but it does so by consuming vast quantities of planetary resources. It's a very inefficient system. Time, this is what we mentioned actually, we're looking at time in a different way, but, but digging into this, this point about um, the, the social aspect, uh, you'll find that uh, the distribution of consumption of carbon emissions closely related also to the distribution of time between paid and unpaid. Now, one of the, th you know, I mean, there's a good quote from Keynes there, so he predicted that by now we'd all be sort of, you know, lounging around, only working 15 hours a week. You might ask what went wrong there. Uh, well, what's gone wrong is that additional material production has been consumed rather than being used in terms of additional leisure, leisure time, particularly since the 1980s. Uh, whereas, in fact, some evidence, you know, frequently suggests that we'd all be up for working a four-day week if only we could afford to do so. Um, social return on investment. So this is... Um, an area where we, 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 tradition, we, we apply economic techniques to sort of prove the case that it's enhanced cost-benefit analysis. You'll be familiar with this, but this is where you can get some quite uh, practical policy-oriented solutions in your research. Uh, most recently, we suggested that uh, the city airport should be closed down and put to alternative uses. That caused lots of excitement uh, amongst uh, various business uh, commentators. Um, because I'm a bit short of time, I'm just going to do some subliminal lecturing. That and that is very important. Uh, actually, no, I'm going to talk about this one because we do, we do a lot of work about complementary currencies. Now, these are new financial instruments. Anybody here heard of Bitcoin? Hands up, please. 
Uh, anybody actually own any Bitcoins? Any hands up? No? Oh, that's a shame. Well, what's interesting, I've put a picture of something there called Solar Coin. And this is like Bitcoin, but you get issued with solar coins if you can prove you have installed additional uh, renewable gener generating capacity. Now, that's quite an interesting financial instrument being put to use to, uh, in a very direct way to enhance, improve the environmental dynamics of the economy. Um, and uh, I have run out of time, but I, 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 can't, I have to mention fish. So my colleague Chris Williams here, please talk to him. But well, th this is quite simply showing you that if you stopped fishing for a few years or reduced it, which would require some investment, over the long term you'd create much more value from fisheries. I have to leave it at that. And finally, you will like this, but in terms of systems, we've got a good piece of work, please look at it, called Model Behaviour, just published. And given the criticism over the IPCC and the fact that we cannot afford to take any policy action because of uncertainty around climate models, we compared how accurate IPCC forecasts have been compared to the forecasts we do take policy action on that emanates from you know, the Department of Transport from the Treasury, hopelessly, hopelessly inaccurate. And yet we take action on that and not the ones on the left. That, ladies and gentlemen, is ridiculous. So I'll leave you with that. That's how we frame progress. Thanks very much for listening.